G'day mate, what are you here? So, thinking more about Iran's first direct attack on Israel on Saturday and how a whole completely unlikely coalition of countries work together to defeat the drone and missile attack and how, how the effectiveness of that, that coalition undermines many of the talking points for isolationism, which is particularly prevalent on the, the dissident right. So it also reflects isolationism, which is dominant among people who watch YouTube videos like this, right? People who spend an above average amount of time online generally do so because their real life interactions are just too anxiety promoting. So people who battle with rage against their co-workers and neighbors, right? People like that, right? They, they prefer online interaction because they feel less anxious, because they feel like they, they have more control over the, the interactions they can just uh, talk to the people they want to talk to and uh, they can construct this ultimate personality online enjoy this e-personality and they can escape the restrictions of, uh, of normal life with you know, various speech codes right? depending on the situation or circumstance that you find yourself in right there's going to be a different speech code right there's a, effectively a different speech code in orthodox Judaism there are many different speech codes in Orthodox Judaism, from modern Orthodox to Hasidic Judaism to the Yeshivish Lithuanian style, non Hasidic Judaism, Haredi Judaism. Uh, New York Orthodox Judaism is quite different, much more intense than uh, Los Angeles uh, Orthodox Judaism. So, uh, people with ADHD who have incredibly volatile emotions, and the emotional component of ADHD doesn't get nearly as much attention as the lack of uh, sustained focus. But uh, people with ADHD are much more prevalent to spend a great deal of time online to essentially get hooked to an online persona or to, to gaming, because these are ways of interacting with people that are less anxiety provoking than normal human interactions. So the personality style and the social style of people who dominate uh, distant right wing or, or distant left wing streams uh, it tends to, to match an, uh, an isolationist foreign policy for which th there are good arguments and uh, i for example would favor the united states withdrawing from nato but in general in life on a personal level and on an international level in a local level and a national level, right? you want to enjoy the best possible relations with other people that you can. So you don't want to be lashing out in anger and peevishness and childishness like Donald Trump. Like Donald Trump probably did damage to our alliances. And while I overall much prefer his foreign policy to that of Joe Biden, his you know, childishness, peevishness, uh, and uh, frequently hostile reactions to our alliances, I think often did not serve the US. So we're drawing from the Trans-Pacific Partnership, right, which would have been a coalition of approximately 12 nations to unite against China. I think that would have been in America's best interest, but Donald Trump withdrew from that because it was such a major hostility to international alliances because he sees them all as ripping America off. But what happened on Saturday in Israel is that the main Sunni Arab nations, right, they worked together to shoot down these Iranian drones and missiles, or at least to transmit information about them. So these missiles were shot down not just by Israeli fighter planes and Israeli air defenses, but by largely American fighter planes but also there were Jordanian fighter planes that were shooting down drones. There were French 
planes shooting down these Iranian missiles and drones. There are British planes shooting down these missiles and drones. We've already had about a dozen nations working together to defeat this Iranian attack on Israel. And so there's a, a knee-jerk reaction among uh, groups that feel isolated, such as Jews and Israeli Jews in particular, like, you know, F the world, we don't need other countries, we're just going to get it done. But that's why it's so important to consider what will the effect of your language and your actions be on other people who are, say, disinterested, right? Disinterested does not mean not interested, it means people who don't have a particular predilection or bias or leaning, and they're open and persuadable. So the way we speak, the way we act, right? Uh, we can send forth you know, good deeds into the world, which are like our ambassadors that march before us and smooth the way for us and make our life a lot easier, or we can send forth foul deeds and foul words that uh, uh, create a bad odor around us and make moving forward more difficult. And Israel engaged in a lot of rhetoric about uh, the Palestinians or, or animals after the, the October 7 attacks which makes it more difficult to create coalitions to defeat things like the Iranian attack. So the Iranians are not Arabs, right? They are Shia Muslims. And they are struggling for supremacy in the Middle East. And uh, Sunni Muslims tend to have a lot of antipathy for the, the Shia, and particularly the revolutionary Iranian regime. But uh, Israel and the United States can make things impossible for the Sunni Arab nations to cooperate with them. But uh, this time around, you know, credit goes to the Biden administration for pulling together this, this coalition. And I think overall the Biden administration has done a better job than the Trump administration at the care and feeding of our alliances. On the other hand, I think Biden's foreign policy has overall been a disaster uh, because of getting us into unnecessary conflicts in Ukraine and in the Middle East. But this time, I credit to the Biden administration. Now, the Sunni nations would not have cooperated if uh, they did not believe that the United States can do everything it could to constrain the Israeli response. So Israel could lose the goodwill that it gained. Right? Israel gained a lot of goodwill after this Iranian attack. Eliminationist rhetoric does not make the world a better place. Pray for the Middle East. I hate to see people killing each other's kids. Right, so eliminationist rhetoric when you're in a fight to the death, which many Palestinians and uh, Israeli Jews certainly feel is understandable, but it makes it more difficult to build it a case for your team, for your side. And a lot of Israeli politicians and pundits engaged in elim eliminationist rhetoric, so it made it that much easier for critics of Israel to make the case that Israel is bent on genocide in Gaza. Now, I don't agree with that analysis, but that analysis has considerable more foundation due to the eliminationist rhetoric by many leading uh, Jewish pundits and Jewish politicians and Jewish public figures who you know, essentially called for the equivalent of the, the nuking of, of Gaza or the destruction of Gaza or the starving of, of Gaza. Right? So strong in-group identities is a wonderful thing. I, I can't imagine living a life without a strong in-group identity, but it absolutely blinds you, right? So the ties the ties that bring you together with other people also completely blind you to the concerns of other people. Joe Biden keeping our troops out of the Middle East is earning my vote. Well, he moved a lot of troops into the Middle East in reaction to October 7th. Uh, aircraft carriers and uh, Navy ships and flying to Israel after October 7th. No other American politician would have done that. Right, that was like completely unnecessary level of uh, American involvement. So tying 
America so closely with the with the efforts going on by Israel against Hamas. That is absolutely bloody war in Gaza, even if you think it's absolutely necessary. And and Biden you know, tied us into it in an unnecessary fashion. But uh, on Saturday night, right, seemed to pull together a coalition. Now, can you imagine any other country not responding to an attack such as what Israel endured on Saturday? Can you imagine the United States, France, Germany, Japan enduring attack of hundreds of drones, dozens of cruise missiles, even if nobody gets killed? I don't think any other major nation with a strong military would fail to respond directly to this kind of assault. But uh, the, the care and maintenance of the alliance structure is not sexy. Right? It's not thrilling. Uh, it's not it's not work that's uh, best suited for those, those of us with you know, narcissistic personality tendencies. But it's so important, right? It, both in our personal lives and communal lives and religious lives and national lives and business lives and in international relations as well. Right? The same skills that the Biden administration used to pull together this diverse coalition of countries to fend off Iran's attack. Right? The same principles work in our, our daily lives if we're able to consider the effect of our words and actions on other people, if we're, if we're willing to keep our own egos in check, uh, because overall, whether you're a nation state, a tribe, a religion, a political orientation, you still want to maintain the best possible relations with other people that you can without selling yourself short. So, one thing that makes America so much stronger than China is that America has strong alliances. Right? China really doesn't have any allies of significance. Right? China's allies are groups like North Korea. Right? They're uh, not exactly world-beating powers. The United States has allies with Japan, Germany, France, United Kingdom, Australia. We have the allies in Europe, allies in Northeast Asia. We, we just surround our greatest geopolitical rival, China, with very effective alliance. And uh, it's, it's certainly the way to go. But if you can possibly maintain an alliance structure, either in personal life or in religious life or communal life or political life, you know, form alliances where you have common interests. So, for example, Jews and Muslims have very different interests in many areas, but there are some areas, say, where traditional Jews and traditional Muslims have something in common, such as, say, opposition to same-sex marriage or opposition to the woke agenda. Right? That's where traditional religious people of, of different, uh, different denominations can come together. And something that we can you know, learn from politicians, right? The successful politicians can really learn that the way to go is to avoid making unnecessary enemies and to try to have the best possible relations with, with other people. So it would be curious to see if Israel squanders the goodwill that it's developed on this Iranian attack. Right. So initially on the aftermath of October 7, there was tremendous goodwill for Israel. And after the Hamas attacks in southern Israel, killed 200 people. And then with Israel's occupation, conquest of Gaza, it lost much of that goodwill. Now Israel has regained some goodwill after Iran's first direct attack. But if Israel overreacts, then it will squander that goodwill. And so when you try to maintain good relations with other people, it's easy to fall off on one of two extremes. One is... I'm just going to do what I think is right. I'm going to stand up for what I think is right. And the hell with the consequences. And this is an approach that will leave 
one as a country and as an individual isolated and it does not give due weight to the power of alliances and relationships. On the other hand, the other extreme that people fall off into is that they refuse to stand up for what they believe in, what's important, what's necessary, so as to not rock the boat in their most important relations. And that extreme doesn't work either, right? The, the wise nation, the wise individual, weighs up the value of relationships and the value of uh, friendships and the value of alliances with speaking the truth. So I see with live streams in particular, uh, very much of a tribal mentality, very dedicated to maintaining relations and I'll invite you on my show and you'll invite me on your show and we'll defend each other. And there are many business advantages and uh, audience advantages to these kind of relationships, but it always comes at a substantial cost in truth. So the way I operate my live stream is that I put the priority on saying what I believe to be true. And I don't put much effort into building alliances with other live streamers. So one of the downsides of this approach is that it can leave me isolated and I don't have as many guests as I used to in the past. Don't have the, the great group discussions that we've had in the past. That's often a falling out with you know, long time viewers and long time contributors to the show because I put a premium on just saying what I believe to be true. And this is very much a minority approach. I know this is in the world of podcasting. So, and there's that expose of Andrew Huberman, the number one fitness podcaster, by Kerry Howley in New York Magazine. Right? You know, all the fellow uh, podcasters in his sphere, like fellow dissidents, like all rally to defend Andrew Huberman, often even without reading the article. Right? They just picked up certain talking points to use in defense of Andrew Huberman because they were, they were banding together in a tribal approach. So usually building alliances is a good way to go. But if you, if it keeps you from saying what you believe to be true in a podcast, then and I think that's way too high a price for building the alliance. Right? So in politics, Right, there are a lot of things far more important than saying what you believe to be true. In real life, there are a lot of things more important than saying what you believe to be true. But if you're going to do a podcast about public events, national events, political events, religious events, uh, science, uh, fitness, right, then your number one agenda should be telling the truth rather than building alliances with other podcasters, right? Podcasters who put a great deal of emphasis on building alliances with other podcasters are not of much interest to me because they talk to the majority opinion in their sphere. They're afraid to rock the boat. They just become predictable in their reactions. So, water politics and uh, social networking right, uh, calls for a different strategy than for the, the effective podcast for